rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those that are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. If you take your Bibles and open up to Isaiah chapter 53 with me, please. We live in a day and age where we hear everything under the sun and as time goes on, I'm reminded that God has been taken out of the picture, out of our educational system, out of our politics, out of the family unit. Jesus is being less spoken of all the time. Well, we as the Lord's church, we need to take a stand. We need to learn and take the Bible and fill ourselves with it so that when we talk, we talk to people that they hear about Jesus. It's easy to go to work or go to school or wherever you might go and talk about fishing. Talk about how it's raining today or how the sun's shining today. But how much does Jesus get talked about? I believe this morning that we have a great opportunity to uplift Jesus. If you're watching this TV program this morning, I pray that through the studying, the reading of the scriptures, that faith will be brought into your heart. Romans chapter 10 verse 17, the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. Isaiah 53 has become one of my great passages of scripture because it talks so much about Jesus. In verse 1 there, Isaiah said, Who has believed our report? And who is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form, no comeliness, and when, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. If you'll take your Bibles, go up to Isaiah chapter 59 with me, please. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Isaiah, some 1,500 years before Jesus was born, talked about how Jesus would be put to death on the cross for our sins. Nothing that he did. Not his sin. He knew no sin. 
but for our sins. And the Bible says because of our sins, God has hid his face from us that he will not hear. That's what sin does. Sin separates us from our Father in heaven, from God. And he will not hear. Yes, many people today think that they pray to God and God hears their prayers. But you know, there, there are um, <clears throat> things that we have to do in order and for God to hear our prayers. First of all, our prayers must be according to God's will. Or he will not hear them. Our prayers are be the prayers that we are seeking Jesus out. We are wanting to know all about Jesus. If our prayers aren't built up on learning about Jesus, they're of no value. Our prayers ought to be that we get the opportunity to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus through the gospel being preached unto us. Come to Jesus repenting in all of our sins. Repentance is simply a change of mind, a turning from the, our conduct and the way that we're living and turn towards God. Then the Bible says we must be baptized by immersion to have our sins washed away and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you when a person is doing that, it's because they're seeking God out in their prayers. When Jesus was on the cross... When Jesus on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't just speak those words like I'm doing right now. He cried him out. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a great question, isn't it? If you'll take your Bibles and go to 1 Peter chapter 2 with me, please. I believe Peter answers that question in a great way. At verse 21, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and the bishop of your souls. I thank God that he was willing to allow his son to leave the splendors of heaven. And I thank Jesus, the Son of God, who was willing to leave the splendors of heaven to come to this old wicked earth. And when he came to this wicked earth, the Bible says that he set an example for us that we should follow in his steps. If you're a Christian this morning, the Bible says that all those that live godly shall suffer persecution. If you're a Christian this morning and you're standing up for God's Word, you're going to suffer persecution. And we shouldn't cry and complain about it. We should thank God and praise God for it. Because I, I remember in the book of Acts where the apostles were beaten and cast into prison for preaching the gospel and they praised God for being able to suffer for the cause of Christ. They praised God for it. And then they continued preaching the gospel. You and I as Christians, we need to follow the example that Jesus set. The Bible said he never did any sin. <laughs> the Bible says that <clears throat> Jesus was tempted in all manner like you and I are, but yet without sin. You know, I can't look up to God in heaven and say, God, you don't know what I'm going through. Because he does. Because Jesus was tempted every way that I am but yet he never sinned once. 
The Bible says he, knew, he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. You know, I don't know what I've done. If I'd been back there and they were beating Jesus the way they did and nailed him to a cross, you know, if I had opportunity to call on to the, the American military, I probably would have. But Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't. Why? Because the Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 16 that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In John 3, 16, we find that God took care of His responsibility. He gave. The rest of the responsibility is upon you and me. Whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. This morning the Bible tells us that when Jesus was persecuted and put to death on the cross, He never once threatened those people. Why? Why? Well, if you hold your place there, this morning we get a good chance to thumb through the Bible and see what the Bible says about it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Hebrew writer, most people think this is the Apostle Paul, says in verse 1 of chapter 12, Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Yet we're told that for to lay, lay aside every weight, every burden, anything that hinders you and me from serving the Lord, we're to lay it aside. We're to run with patience. What's that word patient mean? It means holding on, persevering. We're to run with patience. That race that is set before us. You and I are in a race this morning as Christians. Yeah, we have people who run races in the physical sense for a trophy or for whatever. And it's temporal. It doesn't last. But you and I are in a race. We'll run a race for an eternal crown. For eternity with Jesus in a place where the book of Revelation talks about there's no more sin, there's no death, no sickness, no crime, no pain. We're running a race for that. And we need to hold on. Christians, hold on this morning. Don't let go. Don't let Satan get you away. Don't let the world get you away. Because I'm telling you, the devil will use anything within his power to get you away from the Lord. He will. He'll use your husband. He'll use your wife. He'll use your kids. He'll use your job, your new home, and etc. to get you away from the Lord. We are to endure and hold on and run with patience the race that is set before us. Yeah, you don't get to choose your race, and neither do I. God set that race for you and me. Verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did Jesus not threaten those soldiers when they were nailing him to the cross? Because he knew that he was going to go back and experience the glory that he had as his father in the beginning. He knew that, so he had a joy. But guess what? That joy is twofold. Because he offers that joy to you and me too. He knows that when he died on the cross, was buried, and the third day rose from the dead according to the Scriptures, that he gave every man and woman, not the Jews only, but every man and woman, the opportunity to come to him and spend eternity with him in heaven. Yes, he gave every man and woman the opportunity to come to him. And so that's why he was able to endure the cross and despise the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Back over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse uh, 23, Jesus never threatened them once, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. 
All that Jesus went through when He was on this earth, He committed Himself to the Father in heaven. Because He knew, okay, He knew that when He died, that His Father in heaven was going to raise Him from the dead. Never to die again. The Bible says death has no more dominion over Him. Guess what? The Bible teaches me in Romans chapter 6. Hold your place there again. Let's go over to Romans chapter 6. Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Why do I talk so much about baptism? Because there are those who are talking so much not about baptism. But other ways. You see, there are false teachers out in this world today. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, we're to beware of false teachers who come to us in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. We're the sheepfold of God, and the wolves are trying to get at us. That's why I talk so much about baptism, because the Lord did. The apostles did. In verse 3 of Romans chapter 6, Paul said, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planned together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Paul has a powerful message there. And, I, and this is why I believe. And because at this very moment, there are preachers standing in pulpits in the denominational world. And it is happening in the Lord's church too, and it's a shame. But they're teaching other ways to get to heaven. Now, I know I say this a lot, and, and uh, you know, I'm not a comedian or anything. I'm simply stating the truth. There are those preachers at the end of the sermon, they're telling people to ask Jesus to come into their heart. Or they're telling people, say the sinner's prayer. Or they're telling people, come to the altar and pray through in other ways. My friend, you simply cannot find that in the Word of God. It is not there. You can look for a million years from Genesis to Revelation and you'll never find those words. Why? Because they're not there. Them are the words of Satan. Satan will let you hear anything that will lead you straight to hell. That's why we need to be particular. That's why we need to talk about uh, baptism the way Jesus and his apostles did. Paul said, Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Every one of us, when we're baptized, guess what? We don't have to go to the graveyard. We were buried with him by baptism in his death. That's what the Bible says. And as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, guess what happened to you and me? We were raised from the dead too by the power of God. I believe that we go from crucifixion and we're faithful unto the end to heaven. There's no sinner's prayer. There's no asking Jesus to come to your heart. There's no going to the altar and praying through. It's from the cross, from the crucifixion to heaven. The Bible there said that the old man is crucified with him, put to death. I am not the old J. Jones anymore. And you shouldn't be the old person anymore either if you've been baptized into Christ. You have put that person to death. The Bible says we become new creatures in Christ when we come to that water grave of baptism. God said He will forgive us of our sins. Hebrews chapter 8, the Bible says that He will remember them no more. He has forgotten them. And guess what? If God has forgotten our sins, shouldn't we? Now, no devil in the world's not going to let us forget it. But the one who matters has forgotten them. And we should too. <clears throat> Paul said in Galatians 2.20, 
For I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who died for me and gave himself for me. Paul even used those words, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm telling you this morning that God's Word is full of His truth. We should not listen to men, to preachers. You shouldn't listen to me this morning, by the way. You should be following along, listening to what the Bible says. Because I could be a false teacher dressed up in sheep's clothing. You see, I could be here deceiving you little by little. And how are you going to know? Unless you know the Word of God. That's right. We have a responsibility and follow along. Anytime someone is preaching and teaching you, you have the responsibility to follow along. In verse 24 of 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body. Jesus did not bore his sins, okay? He didn't bear his sins. He had no sins. He was perfect. He was free. He was pure. But he says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree or on the cross. And that's why God turned his back on his only son, would not hear his cry. Because Isaiah 59 says that our sins and our iniquities has caused God to turn his face from us and he would not hear. Jesus bore in his body your sins and my sins. And God turned his back on his son. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he had bore all those wicked and evil sins in his own body on the tree. If you go to 2 Corinthians with me, chapter 5. Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. <clears throat> Verse 21. For he, speaking of God, has made him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How much did God love us? Well, let's ask ourselves a question this morning. Would you allow me to come and take one of your children? And nail them to a cross whether they did Jesus? No. And I wouldn't allow you to come take my children to do that either. Why? Because we don't love each other that much. But I'm telling you, God did love us that much because He allowed His Son to be nailed to the cross. He loves us that much. And because of that, He made the one who knew no sin. Think about it. Jesus came from the splendors of heaven. He didn't know what sin was. He never sinned once. He was pure. And he was holy. And he was righteous. Yet God demanded him to become sin for us. And that's what Jesus did. He took our place on the cross. God demands punishment for sin. There is a penalty of sin. In the Old Testament, if we lived and lived under the Old Testament and we sinned, there was a penalty. There was a penalty for it. But see, Jesus paid that penalty when he died on the cross, when he shed his blood on the cross in his death. He paid the price for you and me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Bible says, Know you not that your bodies is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which, you are, which God has given you, and you're not your own anymore? You've been bought with a price. <laughs> now, I don't know what Americans think about that today. I don't know what uh, Christians think about today. You know, I can stand up here and from God's Word say, you don't belong to yourself anymore, Christian. You're not your own anymore. And you might laugh at me. You might say, well, that's what you think, buddy. I'm telling you, the Almighty God had written in His inspired Word that you've been bought with a price. You have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. And you no longer have the right to serve your own way. But you have the right given to you to serve God. See? And that's what God wants from us. Jesus took our place on the cross. He didn't have to. But he did. 
Jesus could have called any time for angels to come from heaven and set him free. But he didn't. He could have called for the angels to come down where they're nailing him to the cross. But he didn't. Why? Because his love for you and me was too strong for him not to go ahead and do what his father said for him to do. He loved us that much. And the Bible says he took our place. He became sin and we became the righteousness of God. Now I don't understand that folks because if you knew me before I become a Christian nobody liked me. I was loved by nobody. And I don't see how my wife even loved me <laughs> at that time, okay? I had already destroyed the love that anybody had for me. Except for God. Except for Him. He took my place on the cross, you see. I deserve to die, not Jesus. He traded me. And guess what He did? He became sin, <laughs> and I became the righteousness of God. I just, you know, I can't understand that. He became sin. I became the righteousness of God, and so did you. Well, if you were baptized in Christ, He took our place. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, if you'll turn over with me, please. The Bible is very controversial. Because we live in a society, if you took, if you went around and asking people, you took a survey, how much do you study the Word of God? It's been done, my friends. It has been done. And it come to find out the end result is little or none at all. No wonder people don't know God. No wonder people don't know the truth of God's Word. No wonder people can't get to God. Because they don't know the Word of God. You see, God isn't going to speak to you and I verbally today. He did at one time, but He Himself chose it not to be that way. He now speaks to us through His Son Jesus, Hebrews chapter 1. In, in, in the old days, He spake unto us by the prophets. But in these last days, He speaks to us through His Son. Jesus. And the, in the Gospel, John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, capital G, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. And verse 14 of that same chapter, the Bible says, And the Word, the capital W, became flesh. Well, who became flesh? It's Jesus. And dwell among us. That's what Jesus did. He is the Word. And that's why we need to study His Word. John chapter 14 verse 15, the Bible says that if ye love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commands. Well, if you don't know what God's commands are, how can you love Him? You know, I can tell my wife that I love her just with words for a thousand years, a hundred times a day. And it won't mount to a hell of beans. Until we go through thick and thin together. And we're still married. Then it's when we have proved our love one for another. I remember Abraham. God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, up on the mountain and sacrifice him. And Abraham took his son Isaac and some slaves and some donkeys and carried the material that he wanted. And they went to the mount that God told him. And I, uh, Abraham and Isaac went up the mountain. He put him on the altar, tied him down, put the wood around it, ready to set the fire, and he took a knife and was going to kill his son. And an angel of the Lord appeared unto him. He said, Abraham, do thy son no harm. Now I know that you love me. God don't ask you and me to do that today. But he still wants us to prove our love to him. Many today have the attitude that I don't prove myself to nobody. Well, my friend, you're mistaken. You had to prove yourself to God. Hold your place there in Acts chapter 2. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul's letter to the young evangelist Timothy. 
wrote this letter. He said, Study to show thyself approved unto God. We have to prove ourselves to Him. Study to show thyself approved unto God. How do we prove it, un, ourselves unto Him? By studying His Word. That's how we do it. By studying His Word. No other way. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. A preacher once said one time, I asked this man, are you a Christian? He said, yes. He says, do you study the word of God? He said, yes. Well, how do you study? He says, well, I start opening up the pages of God's word, and wherever it lands, and I point my finger to a verse of Scripture, and that's where I read and study. And where he pointed was, he says, Judas, he went out and hanged himself. And then he turned the pages again, like this, and he took his finger and pointed out another verse of Scripture, and it says, and go do thou likewise. Now that wasn't very fruitful, was it, of a study? Well, God doesn't want us to study that way. That's why. He wants us to rightly divide the word of truth. In other words, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. That's what we need to do. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, this is the day that the doors were open to the church, to the kingdom of God. Now, when I talk about the church, I'm going to talk about this building all buildings are going to burn one of these days when Jesus returns and destroys the world by fire. Not by flood again, but by fire. But now the doors to the church, the kingdom of God is open for all people. See, the Jews are not God's chosen people anymore. Now, I know there are people who uh, think that I, I'm crazy for saying that. But the Jews are not God's chosen people anymore. The church is. The saints are. Those who have repented of their sins, been baptized into Jesus Christ, and are living faithful unto the end. Them are the spiritual Jews. The Bible says so. And on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus arose from the dead, Jesus appointed twelve apostles, and at this present time, Judas had taken his life, and there were only eleven then in Acts, the latter part of Acts chapter 1, they uh, ordained another man to take Judas's place, which was Matthias. And there were 12 apostles again. Then in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as a rushing mighty wind, and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a gas of fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And no, I do not teach the speaking of tongues as they did back then on the day of Pentecost. The speaking of tongues is simply a speaking other languages. And the only reason they spoke in tongues on that day because it's done miraculously because of the Holy Spirit. It enabled them to speak in one language and every language that people had heard and understood, you see. They heard and understood in the language that they were born with. But you see, we don't have the gifts of the Holy Spirit today. Okay? That died when the last apostle died almost 2,000 years ago. We have no apostles today. We have no the, not, the nine spirit, spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit today. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, if you'll turn over there with me, please. Peter said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Those Jews that stood outside Pilate's hall, Pilate was questioning Jesus and determined to let him go because they found no fault in him. But the Jews, God's chosen people, said, Crucify him! Crucify him! 
and let His blood be on us and on our children. Those same Jews are there on the day of Pentecost that day, and Peter and the apostles preached the very first gospel sermon to them. And they didn't say it was okay. They didn't try to warm their hearts and make them feel good. They told them the truth. And this is what they said. Verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The Jews wanted Jesus crucified. The Roman soldiers were the ones who literally crucified him. And guess what? You and I are responsible for Jesus being crucified too. Because Jesus would not have left heaven and come to this earth if it wasn't for your sins and my sins. He died for our sins. He washed our sins away. We put him on the cross too. And verse 37, it says, When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The greatest question anyone could ever ask in this world. What shall we do? They realized that they had killed the Son of God, the one God sent to save them. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, not ask Jesus come to your heart, not kneel at the altar and pray through, not say the sinner's prayer, but repent. And that word and or connects them together. Means what is going to be said is just as important what has already been said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. There weren't different ways to be saved. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Every person that's going to get to heaven has to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. In the authority of Jesus Christ. Not in the authority of the Pope or some preacher. But in the authority of Jesus Christ. For, this is the purpose for baptism. I tell you what, you hear people saying all kinds of things about baptism. And the Bible plainly states it's for the remission of sins. For the forgiving of your sins. And it says, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To help you live the Christian life. You see, God didn't put a life before us and set us on it and leave us alone. <laughs> he gave us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He gave us His inspired Word. Written, complete Word. We have no excuse this morning is what I'm saying. There is no excuse for not being able to know God, come to Him, obey Him, and live for Him until Jesus comes back. What about you this morning? Have you been to Jesus? Have you been washed in the blood? If not, the Bible says you need to repent of your sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living and you turn towards God. The Bible says you must be, uh, be baptized by immersion, not sprinkling, not poured upon, but by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. To become a Christian, that's what you have to do. If you are a Christian this morning, and you've not been living as close to God as He wants you to, that's because of sin, my friend. And sin will separate us from God. And praise God that He made provision for the Christian. Oh, you don't have to be baptized again. But the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we... <clears throat> We'll confess our sins to Him, speaking of Jesus. He's just and He's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in His heart.